Flash is a name in the technology industry that grows more and more obscure with each passing year. Once the platform behind nearly every interactive application on the web, you'd be hard-pressed now to find a recent browser that still supports the standard. Where did this key component of the web come from, and what caused its demise? Our story begins like most do, at a science fair. In his high school years, Jonathan Gay had been a frequent programmer of his Apple II computer. He wrote games like Space Invaders and Basic, and eventually went on to create a drawing program called Super Paint. Following Super Paint's award-winning success at his science fair, Jonathan and his father bought a Macintosh. Back in those days, software development for the Mac couldn't be done on the computer itself. It required the Apple Lisa, an obscure and prohibitively expensive machine that was more powerful than the Macintosh. As luck should have it though, Jonathan met a Lisa owner at his local Mac users group by the name of Charlie Jackson. Jackson sought to form his own Macintosh software company, Silicon Beach Software, and invited Jonathan, still in high school, along with him. Some of the first programs Jonathan wrote for the Mac were games like Airborne, Dark Castle, and Beyond Dark Castle, all of which proved to be successful enough to pay for his college education. Beyond games, Jonathan returned to his Super Paint program, porting it over to the Macintosh as Super Paint 2. And, after being bought out by the Aldus Corporation, known for their PageMaker program, he released IntelliDraw. That program was special because it allowed for intelligent links between objects. Instead of having to adjust a drawing by hand, the files were interactive. Adjust one object, and the rest would follow suit. With the success he saw with IntelliDraw, Jonathan decided it was time for him to form his own company. One of the new technologies that caught his eyes was the stylus. No, not that stylus. The stylus on the pen computers by a company called Go. Back in 1993, Go ruled the day for pen-based computers, and they were even in development of their own pen-based operating system. After Jonathan convinced Charlie Jackson to spend the money, the pair founded their next company, FutureWave Software, and started work on a pen-based version of IntelliDraw that they called SmartSketch. It's too bad, though, that once they finished the program in 1994, AT&T had just bought out Go, and frustrated with the company's lack of progress, pulled the plug on the project. FutureWave was left without a market, and it seemed the only way to make anything back on the software they had developed was to port it over to Windows and Macintosh computers. This didn't pan out too well, though, since their program was just one of many in the PC market, alongside more established programs like Adobe Illustrator and Aldus Freehand. If there was any way SmartSketch was going to survive, it would have to be by being salvaged into something else. After some experimentation in 1995 with animation features in the program, FutureWave decided to combine their product with another new technology. The Internet! They experimented with an embedded Java animation player, but after abysmal performance moved on to creating a Netscape Navigator plugin. Originally, the program was going to be called SmartSketch Animator, but since SmartSketch was mostly unknown, other names were tossed around, like Cell Animator and eventually Future Splash Animator. FutureWave was nervous, though, about their relative obscurity and attempted twice to sell off Future Splash to a larger and more influential company. First they tried Adobe and were rejected because of the software's at the time limited performance. They tried again with Fractal Design, who they rejected because they proved to be uninterested in FutureWave's animation software. Left with no other options, the company relented and released Future Splash Animator by themselves in 1996 to moderate success. Thanks to interest from Microsoft and Disney Online, the animation tool began to gain more mainstream popularity. By the end of the year, Micromedia had contacted FutureWave about acquiring their animation tool, renaming it to its more familiar name, Macromedia Flash. What made Flash ideal for online video was its ease of use and small file sizes. Even Macromedia's own program, Director, produced files in the megabytes of size, while Flash files were about one-tenth of that. Being so small meant loading times were much shorter. Add in the days of slow dial-up speeds and limited internet usage, and this played to Flash's advantage, along with Macromedia's decision to release the Flash Player Browser plugin for free, making Flash the most popular format for interactive online content over its contemporaries Java, QuickTime, Real Networks, and Windows Media Player. After being bundled in with the popular web browsers of the day, as well as Windows XP, 92% of internet users had Flash Player installed. At first, Flash was a pretty basic animation tool. It had a few options for vector graphics, bitmapped images, and limited sound. But with each annual release, the program became more capable. Along with smaller changes, like the introduction of MP3 audio, Macromedia began toying with the idea of interactive content in Flash. ActionScript, similar to JavaScript, enabled Flash to do far more than just animations. The level of interactivity it offered gave way for a slew of rich internet applications, and more importantly, games that could be played right in your web browser. The list of multimedia features Flash offered just continued to grow. 
After taking a hiatus from the program, Jonathan Gay experimented with something he called Tin Can, online video conferencing through Flash, which meant that Flash could now handle video streaming. Of course, this feature didn't go unnoticed, eventually acting as the backbone for an obscure little website called YouTube. The same year YouTube was born, Adobe was finally convinced of the Flash project that they had turned down years before, and bought out all of Macromedia. Under Adobe, Flash brought support for more multimedia formats, introduced more animation tools, and even some fancy new features like 3D support. It seemed that nothing could even hope to dismantle the Adobe Flash kingdom, and yet all it took was one pocket-sized problem. The year 2007 brought the introduction of a new must-have product, the iPhone. Of course, one of the major selling points of the iPhone was that it supported fully featured web browsing on a portable device, when most other smartphones viewed simplified versions of web pages. Fully featured web browsing on the iPhone is somewhat of a stretch though, and Apple's most notable omission was Flash Player. Despite criticisms for not supporting Flash on Apple's mobile devices, Steve Jobs published an open letter stating why Apple would continue excluding Flash. Jobs accused Flash of being controlled by Adobe, unlike the more open HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript standards. He also mentioned Flash's troubled security record, as well as stating that Flash was inefficient for low-power mobile processors. Some arguments were returned that Apple's App Store was just as closed as Flash was. In response, Apple did allow for Flash programs to be exported into apps through Adobe's iOS Packager, but they never did give Flash support for their web browser. Even Adobe itself, a year after the Jobs letter, ceased development on Flash support for mobile browsers altogether. In the interest of supporting as many users as possible, most web developers moved toward newer standards like HTML5 and WebGL, which not only could do what Flash could do, but were also open standards and could be used by mobile devices and desktops alike. Thanks to these changing standards, Flash support dropped fairly quickly, with even Adobe in 2015 urging developers to move away. Chrome, as of 2016, blocks Flash content. And earlier this year, Adobe announced that its support of Flash would cease by 2020. Some petitions have gone around in attempts to have Adobe Flash made open sourced, but even those petitions are realistic about Flash, and are interested mostly in legacy support for older Flash-based websites. Flash, for all intents and purposes on the modern web, is dead. Something pretty odd to hear when just 10 years before almost every web application was Flash-based. Websites like Club Penguin, Newgrounds, and YouTube were all built on Flash, and while some evolved to newer standards in order to stay relevant, others still use Flash, and in most browsers are as good as dead. The name Flash couldn't be more accurate in describing the platform, whose popularity grew and fell so quickly. Essentially, a flash in the pan. Even though it's fallen into disuse, Flash has played a major role in creating the web as we know it today. Not bad for something that started out as a science fair project.